My name is Jim Goodrich. I'm a real estate and construction partner at Saul Ewing, Einstein and Lear and vice chair of the firm's construction practice group. On behalf of the construction practice group, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. There are three critical components of any construction project, making sure the proper work is done, that it's done on time, and that it's done on budget. We're gonna focus on the final of these, or the, the third of these, keeping it on a project on budget. Um, if you have a couple of housekeeping items first, and before I introduce our panelists, uh, if you have questions, we will do our best to answer them, just put them in the Q&A spot. And also this would not be a webinar, much less a webinar put on by a law firm unless we had a legal disclaimer. And so here we go. The provision and receipt of the information in this presentation is not legal advice, does not create a lawyer client relationship and should not be acted upon without seeking professional counsel who have been informed of the specific facts. And now with that, I'd like to introduce our three wonderful distinguished panelists. Thomas Foz and Brian Rennie, Jonathan Williams. Thomas is Director of Development and Construction at COPT. Brian is the Director of, um, with uh, Zuda Construction Company. And Jonathan is the owner and principal of Real Projectives. Thomas, can you elaborate a little bit more on your background, please? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, I've been working throughout the DC, Northern Virginia, Baltimore, market in development and construction for about 25 years now. For the last 15, I've worked with uh, Corporate Office Properties Trust as a development director in construction. And uh, prior to that, I cut my teeth in uh, general construction with both Whiting Turner and Davis Construction, primarily down in, in the district. For those that don't know us, um, COP, we're a public REIT, real estate investment uh, company, who owns, manages, leases, develops, and selectively um, acquires uh, uh, office data center properties, most of the properties that are involved in national security, defense, and IT. Um, I lead the development in Anne Arundel County, Howard County, some down in Prince George's, and I, I lead most of our redevelopment efforts of, of existing assets as well. Great, thank you. Brian. Great, thanks, Jim. Thanks everyone for having me today. My name is Brian Rennie, and I'm Director of Construction uh, with Bazuto Construction Company. I've been with the company about 10 years and oversee all of our renovation work, um, our Boston portfolio from our construction side, and various other uh, new construction deals in the DC, Maryland, Virginia. For those of you that don't know the Bazuto Group, really a, a, a three-part um, business unit. We have a management company that stretches from New England down to the Southeast Florida markets, all the way over to California, and manages about 80,000 units. A uh, development company that does three to four Class A apartment starts per year in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and Boston markets. And then our construction company that will do about $600 million this year in construction. 20% is uh, our own work and about 80% is, uh, is for third parties. So looking forward to uh, sharing some of our strategies with you all today. Great. Thank you, Brian. Jonathan. Thanks, Jim. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, pleased to join Brian and Thomas to have a great discussion today about uh, costs on projects. Uh, I've been in the business for about uh, almost 30 years and uh, started Real Projectives 13 years ago. We're a consulting and project management firm. We work on a wide variety of project types all around the United States. Typically, we're acting as either an owner or an investor representative to help do due diligence, oversee projects, manage projects, and really dr drive results and manage risks along the way. And one of those key risks is uh, cost. So looking forward to talking about that. Great, thanks. Thomas, let's start with you. When COPT is contemplating the acquisition of a site on which construction would occur, how do you view potential construction on the site and controlling? And I understand controlling is, no, we don't really control construction costs, we just do our best. Controlling construction costs. And what do you see as the biggest risk, risk factors for potential construction on a site? Well, to fully understand that question, Jim, you kind of have to understand a little bit of our, um, our, our business model. We're a little bit different in that we hold for long-term cash flow and investment. We're not a merchant builder that might be in a project for three to five years or so. So we purchase land in very big chunks. In my time, we've, we've added 250 acres 
uh, to the National Business Park. Uh, we bought 80 acres in Arundel Preserve. And we, we buy these large chunks, not just for one building, but for communities um, or commercial office communities and sometimes in residential parks as well, like over at Arundel Preserve. So, um, again, long-term growth, and we locate adjacent to uh, – uh, large economic drivers like Fort Meade. So when we think about construction, we have a very long-term perspective. When I think of construction and construction budgets, some of the biggest things that I've got to get my arms around, because well, let's face it, all of us here are, are really risk managers of construction costs. Uh, and when I say construction, that's really full project. That soft costs, entitlement costs, construction costs, uh, really just about everything. But when I think of controlling the cost, what I need to first get my arm around is really the unknown. And, you know, they you got that adage and you guys on the panel, I'm sure know it. Seventy percent of your risk and your costs are behind you once you're out of the dirt. So mass grading, uh, utilities, environmental issues, um, those things generally related to the land is something I go in and attack first and really try to get my arms around because they can really lead to the biggest swings. Once you get out of the land and work toward vertical building development, then my focus and concentration goes to the five uh, or six divisions of construction that are gonna influence the cost of a building the most. Uh, site work, again, being the, the biggest. Concrete, steel, um, mechanical, glass and glazing, your facade materials, but those five, six, seven trades or divisions really make up for about 80% of the entire project. And if you can mitigate the risks on those, you can, it, 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 you've mitigated most of your risk and it's a lot easier to bring your projects in within budget. Jonathan, when a private equity investor or a real estate owner approaches real projectives about a construction project, how do you approach the issue of controlling costs? Yeah, good question. So I think we back up one notch before that and say, well, almost everybody, when it talks about control, we're trying to measure like against the budget, usually either a pro forma, if it's a, if it's a new development that has an income side and an expense side, if it's a CapEx project, there's, there's, there's always some form of budget. So to me, it starts with, with setting a realistic budget and how do you go about doing that is, taking some of the stuff that Thomas talked about of really under understanding underlying assumptions about conditions of the work and of the property and things like that. Those are really important things to understand. And then also, as Brian will talk about to, you know, the tie forward, what's it take to actually build something and make it happen. Um, and there's also an element that comes into play, which is understanding the priorities. Um, I understand there's a wide variety of folks on this call. And so if you're an institutional owner, you have a different perspective on cost, like short-term versus long-term, versus if you're like, as Thomas mentioned, more of a merchant builder or an investor that's trying to get your money back within a year or two or three years. That, that, that starts out at a different approach. If you're, if you're an Amazon or a data center developer, like time is really money. So I might be more concerned about getting something done faster and spend some more money to do so than actually just trying to get the, the cheapest cost I can get. So having those discussions up front and, and building into the budget, the expectations that match um, what we're trying to accomplish with each project, I think is really fundamental. And then that sets the parameters for how you manage costs going forward and, and focus your energies because there's a lot of things to, to address um, in any one project. That's a very good point by Jonathan. I, I Jonathan, because I think oftentimes you think of construction period as static, but as you mentioned with data centers in particular, sometimes it may make sense to go over your budget, overspend just to get the cash flows flowing more quickly because it's more opportunistic to do so. Yeah, we get into student housing, for instance, right? That has a window of opportunity. If you, if you miss delivery on a, on a project, you might miss a whole season of students moving in. So um, or again, an Amazon delivery center, they, they, they have a lot of people waiting on their packages. And so that needs to be done on time. And so time might be more important than money, so. Right, and, and the, those three uh, stools can 
uh, or pillars can really be in tension with each other. If it's if if time is the priority, then you're willing to uh, risk a little bit on budget. Speaking of budgets, uh, Brian, how does Pazuta Construction approach budgeting when bidding on a project? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, you know, for us, you know, we put value on our pre-construction side more heavily than we think most do. And the reasoning for that is, you know, if a job's not planned well before we get into operations, it's really doomed to try and, you know, fix it while you're under the gun, especially if you're talking about a student housing deal, which, you know, we, uh, we alluded to or a data center, et cetera. There's really no time to make up your errors. So for us, you know, having a really high level of focus on pre-construction and making sure that we're thinking through all the different uh, risk factors in the project before we get into operation is something that we're hyper-focused on. Um, getting into some of the weeds of how we put together our budgets, you know, we have a really good historical database of existing costs, whether it be by product type, um, you know, construction type, geographical location, et cetera, that we utilize at the very beginning of a project when an owner comes to us and asks for a rough order of magnitude for a very schematic type design on a project. Um, so using some historical data allows us really to provide some guardrails out of the gate on a project and then, you know, sort of guide ownership on some, some large decisions before we really get into the weeds. Um, right at that time or a little bit afterwards, we do like to bring in some of our subcontractors to price out some of the unique items that could be on a project, whether it's a, a, a teardown type project where we have to get a demolition sub involved, or if it's a heavy earthwork type project or a glass and glazing product that we're looking to get some pricing on. So we use our relationships um, with our subcontractors in the market early on to help guide some of the early decision making that happens on a project because once some of those early decisions are made it's kind of hard to change those after the fact once you get through design development and schematic design. Um, so for us, you know, utilizing our historical data and bringing in our subcontractors early is really allow us to be much more accurate out of the gate from the onset with our with our development teams that we're working with so that we can make sure that the numbers we give them at the original onset of their uh, pro forma is actually what we're able to build the project for. Um, and for us, you know, we, uh, we like to be involved in the pre-construction meetings all the way through. So, you know, we don't want to see a project when it's all the way through design development. We want to be there at the onset. We want to have our pre-construction team involved from the get-go so we can sort of guide some of those, some of those pieces. Um, and along with that, you know, we'll do value engineering, third-party assessments to help with the design development to ensure that we're actually able to, um, to, 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 to provide them an accurate budget. I think that, that, that's such a great point. I think the pre-construction effort that Brian just hammered can't be oversold. Uh, that, that is by far, I think, one of the biggest services and things that we do in reaching out to general contractors like Brian's group or commercial ones and, and getting various uh, points of opinion on how to go about that and which trades are critical at which times. Because in, as we all know, sometimes wood's expensive, sometimes steel's expensive, sometimes these different systems are difficult to get and have lead times. And going through the pre-construction effort is absolutely critical to the success of any project. Yeah, Brian, um, Brian, how do you, how do you, how do you go ahead, John. I was going to ask just how do you how do you approach different locations and the and the differences in costs and expectations in different markets? Yeah, so for us, I mean, luckily, you know, given the breadth of our development and management team and our construction arm, we have a really good grasp on all the historical data and in current market trends. But we also bring in our subcontractors. You know, as smart as we think we are at construction, we're a construction manager. We're not an HVAC firm or a, or an exterior skin uh, company. So we'll bring in our subcontractors early in, in, on a lot of projects and have them guide the process and be a part of the design process. You know, we do, um, you know, third party uh, design work as well from a, from a design build perspective. We have an in-house virtual design team that helps manage that. So to the extent that we can bring our subcontractors early to help work with the architect and, and, and the design folks to, to guide the process, we find that to really allow ownership to get their best bang from the buck from the folks that are installing it on a daily basis and, uh, and working through the issues to kind of get that expertise that um, you know, we're all lacking and, 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 and can utilize our subcontractors for. I think real estate, such a local business and Jonathan, I'm glad you asked that because we have another large development down in Alabama. And sometimes we use the buildings that we've designed up here to bring down there. And you would intuitively think that the cost per square foot are going to be similar, which they're oftentimes not. 
just like the market rental rates are different, the, the, the construction costs are different. The same building that we've recently designed and bid and have gone under contract up here in Maryland, the same building we brought down there um, is literally 10 to $12 a, a square foot more expensive in Alabama where we're getting less rents. So right. it, it's, oh, there's a host of, well, a lot of it, we believe is the timing that we bought the project here in Maryland. A big part of that is we bought the project January, February, when the construction market was really hungry to buy, uh, to buy a project. Whereas literally two or three months later, because of the pandemic, um, cost literally jumped through the roof. And while wood was expensive last year and, and remains expensive now, that doesn't fluctuate us very much because we're steel and concrete guys, right? Um, but there are other things like steel that's pricing has literally gone up week by week. We've been close to the steel suppliers talking about what's the cost per ton in the market. And if we, we've had the benefit with our local project to buy the steel, um, that literally took a, a 15%, 20% jump, if not more, um, over a course of a month, a month or two for the building that was purchased down in Alabama. So it's, there's a lot of reasons for it. Also, expertise of the local contractors. Um, a smaller market like Huntsville, Alabama may not have the expertise that we have up here and the competition. That's another big reason. But we've gotten burned by this a couple of times in using rattling off cost per square foot. What does a building cost? 120 bucks a square foot. That might be a different answer down in Alabama. And we have to factor that in because everything is um, dependent on our rents are dependent on the costs that we're dumping into the performance. And if I could add, if I could add some things, oh, go ahead, Brian. Sorry. Yeah, Tom, we see that in our local markets even closer than than, than Alabama. You take a DC project that's you know got some sort of federal funding where we're dealing with the first source requirements or local hiring initiatives. Oh. We could pay ten to twenty percent more than if you lifted that same product up and put it here in Greenbelt where we're based. So I think you know there's geographical disparities from a cost perspective, whether you're building in DC, Maryland, Bama. Or New England, and then there's also timing, right? So you know, if we were to price that same job a year ago versus today, where you're seeing a, a three x on lumber cost, steel, copper, PVC, all escalating. You know, um, you know, you have to. So in essence, you really have to be careful about using those gross square foot costs when you're building your pro forma right. because all of those variants. This is uh, related to both timing of the product and the geographical location can really swing the number and get you in trouble. Jonathan, what did you want to contribute? Also? Yeah, if I could add, uh, to, I, I agree with both everything Thomas and Brian said. I would add in, there's probably one obvious one, which is if you're working in a union market, the labor rate is different than a non-union market. And then there's some others that sometimes people forget about thinking about that really can dramatically affect price, which is, Thomas touched on a little bit, the, the availability of the local, local labor to be able to execute certain things um, doesn't always work in certain areas like framing one way versus another way. A really, a, a really subtle one that not everybody always pays attention to. In the East Coast, if you want smooth finished drywall, it's standard. Western half of the United States, an orange peel, kind of a rougher finish is standard. So if you have a designer that specifies the opposite in different places of the country, it can cost you twice as much just to do a simple little, um, this, this could apply to a renovation job as well as a new development, cost you twice as much to do drywall work. Um, just because uh, the architect specified a different finish. And, um, and those are things to watch out for. Um, and, and then there's also the local jurisdictions and what their pet peeves are in certain places, cities versus suburbs and everything else can dramatically impact the costs of, and those, those need to be factored in. So one of the things we always pay attention is whoever's planning on putting the budget together or building the project, what is their experience in the marketplace? Because those can really um, you know, really impact both the cost and the, and what it actually takes to finish the job. So. That can really vary from, uh, and, and, and Brian, you said it even closer to the market. You're absolutely right. We might, we'll use one contractor type in the suburbs, but we won't use that same type of contractor in more urban locations and vice versa. And sometimes, sometimes the big, huge contractors, they can't be competitive with our little five story, six story buildings 
when they're typically used to doing much bigger things in the district, again, and vice versa. So we have different contractors for different you know, areas that we work in different products. So Thomas, you touched on site costs and said that land costs can be up to 70% of costs or 70% of risk factors or, or the variance. Um, obviously you want to do an environmental study and, or, and see if there are environmental issues and a geotechnical study and, and, but you can't possibly know everything. And so how do you go about trying to uh, mitigate risks with this, a, a site beyond sort of basic studies and especially given the, the fact that on a large site, you might not know everything that's there. That, that's a, that, that is a great question because we oftentimes buy land, even sometimes in my past, we bought land here before we even had the zoning in place and, the, and all the entitlements. Typically a merchant builder will push off closing up until the time he gets a building permit. So his risk is mitigated, his or her risk is mitigated. We'll buy land sometimes, or we have far prior to that. Step one is, is which is obvious, try to identify all the risks you possibly can, whether regional risk, market risks, physical risk, environmental, forestation, um, soil properties, underground storage tanks, either on your property, other properties. Great. Do I mention even grave sites? We probably all have dealt with a little bit of those. I don't like to admit it, but there's, there's so many risks in the land. Now, just the obvious stuff. Well, you know, we, we do office buildings with site parking and we need, you know, six, eight, 12 acres for just one building. That's relatively flat. If you have steep slopes out there and got to do mass grading, that can really move the needle on costs. And we see, you know, uh, steeper sites. Um, and I would like to hear Brian, your input on this. I think that works a lot better for your buildings, whereas you're maybe providing one parking space per thousand square feet that you're developing, and I'm having to do four. So I'm doing a lot more parking, and people that don't understand what that implication is, um, that's a, it takes up a lot more space. And if you're constrained environmentally, that could mean to get the density that you want, you got to build a parking structure, which costs on average three times the amount of a site space. So a lot of those kind of considerations go in um, and, and, you know, are, that aren't always obvious. We could talk all day to list all those risks. Yeah, and Tom, I would, uh, I'd echo all your sentiment. You know, a lot of times some of the most unforeseen costs that we get that affect dollars and time is, is with the site work. And, you know, obviously everybody gets some sort of environmental study done or a phase one and does some borings, but nine times out of 10, they're never enough. And it's, we wish we did more. And whether that's a strategy to get to closing or whether that's just a miss, you know, I think it's sort of a mixture of both. But for us, you know, understanding how you're gonna utilize the site, how you're gonna work through the site, if there's utilities in your way, what the environmental um, and st structural bearing capacities are, are, are really some of the most critical risks on the job. You know, our historical data, we can tell you how much your building is gonna cost once we get our, our, once we start going vertical. And those costs of the variances on those are so minimal that it's almost negligible. But the underground work, the utility and the infrastructure work, the contaminated soils that we run into and a lot of our DC projects, those are the big budget busters. So if there's any real recommendations that we have related to site with the owners, it's you cannot do enough investigation. The dollars that you spend on investigation are pennies compared to the time, the aggravation and headaches you'll deal once you're under construction, if you do in fact miss something. So I agree with you. I think, you know, the site work piece, if anybody on here is a developer and they're listening, pay attention to it, spend the dollars. I know everybody tries to keep those budgets thin when they're not closed, but it can really save you a lot of headaches down the road. And I, completely, Jim, Jim. I completely agree with that. I would, I would add in more specifically, like spend more money on the environmental, not just do a basic environmental phase one, but if you're in certain areas of the country and you're near rivers and streams, think about ecology, the, um, whether there's cultural resource issues, they can bite you really, really badly and not only cost, but time if you encounter those like uh, those cemeteries or the or endangered species or something like that, that often gets skipped in, and it's not part of a standard phase one report. It's an add-on um, that's really appropriate in certain areas of the country. 
and, and do more borings if you can, spend time trying to balance the site if you can, right? So you're not importing or exporting more soil than you need to. Um, that, that's a challenge in certain areas, obviously, but to the extent you can, um, it's worth spending time with the design team to really, and maybe even excavation contractor to go through scenarios about really quantifying that and redesign. Sometimes just moving the buildings around can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars on the same site. Um, so it's worth spending the time. Everybody's always in a rush, like Brian mentioned, and we're always looking to get things done faster, but um, that comes at the expense again at a trade-off of you could be uh, bearing some costs that nobody would like to like to bear. So definitely encourage spending as much energy and effort as you can, including dollars on the, that investigation up front will often save people a lot of money in the, in the end. So what Thomas, you were starting to kind of, did you want to add anything on to that? Or we should go on to another. Well, well, all I was going to add is a point of clarity to what you mentioned and my, my clarity about that 70% comment. And, and what I meant by that is, once you get out of the dirt, 70% of your risk is mitigated and you're beyond it. As Brian mentioned, he knows what it costs. He can control his building. I can control my building generally um, with, with what, we, you know, what it's going to cost and come in at. However, anything underground, all the unknowns um, that Jonathan just rattled off, those are a lot of those things, even as much studying as you do, you're still going to run into some things, water underground that you didn't hit in the study, all kinds of things that are going to run up or have potential to run up your costs. But once you get to, say, a slab on grade or a, a pad site, and that's why a lot of developers are two types of developers, right? Land developers and building, vertical building developers. Some people just buy the finished pad sites from like, you know, in this area, the Rouse Company used to be a big land developer that would improve sites and sell them off to groups like us who would build a vertical building. And you're paying for that finished pad site because a lot of the risk is already taken out of it. Not all the risk, but a lot of it is. Um, but if you go to a virgin site, uh, a forested site per se, sometimes you don't know what you're gonna run into. Once you get beyond that, again, once you get to your slab on grade, you can primarily control most everything above. Yeah, that, great or clarification there. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody. I don't know if anybody on the line here is from Florida, but Florida in particular has flood zones, obviously, and so like really understanding where you are related to a flood zone and what's called a base flood elevation um, is really important. Whether you're building a new building or whether you're trying to modify an existing building, especially if you're trying to modify something existing, and it may be it, you may not be allowed to do it in the local jurisdiction without actually raising the entire building. We've had to do that already where you lift an entire building up by a couple of feet to get it out of the floodplain. Very expensive, very time consuming. It's uh, make sure you understand that one and you budget for it appropriately. So, Don't you see that, Jonathan, in Baltimore? I remember, I, I'm not our Baltimore guy, our Canton guy. We don't land in Canton. But I remember there being a lot of talk about the flood zone and how close you are uh, uh, to the water and and the elevation of the building might get pushed up and that that's a significant expense that you know is a regulatory expense that if you own the land you may not have factored that in right exactly it can yeah, happen out here. A few projects in, in baltimore where we've had to design around it build in automated floodgates that weren't originally planned for and deal with a lot of unforeseen costs like dewatering systems etc um, that weren't necessarily in the pro forma that, you know, they hurt, you know, an automated flood system is not cheap. So it's very important to, you know, I would never just rely on a phase one and think you're good to go as essentially where I think we're getting to, right? So you're going to get your phase one. That's going to come, you know, from, from the seller, obviously, as part of the package, but investigate as much as you can after that. Get a good geotechnical consultant on board, a good civil on board, and do your diligence early in the game because there's so many things that you can that can really derail your project and give you some unforeseen costs that are buried inside, inside the earthwork package. That's that's really interesting, Jonathan. Would you always tell your equity owners and your owner clients to get a phase two, even if a phase one does not have any or show any risk factors? 
Um, no, because I, I would differentiate by the stuff that I was suggesting is an enhancement to a phase one, to a to a baseline phase one, if I could call it. It's not a phase two where you're usually a phase two is destructive versus a phase one is more research and, and analysis. So this would be going above and beyond. The, it, it would be in between a phase one and a phase two would be the simple explanation, uh, add-ons to the phase one. Um, so the same, so, same thing could be for, you know, a title search. It could be that there's add-ons to some of these things. So it's important to think about what's the standard and then what are, there's a whole bunch of options to title, survey, environmental, and thinking through in your particular site, um, which of those enhancements or the, those additional services, if you want to look at it that way, are, are important to your particular site, I think is worth taking the time to, to think about. Yeah, Jim, I think if you take a look at like a wooded site in the middle of Gaithersburg, Maryland, versus a site near the water that's been 150 years old, that has been developed three times in downtown Washington, DC, you could have a phase one for both of those projects, but you're going to do a lot more investigation on that project in DC that you know has been utilized for 150 years, has a lot of neighboring properties that could be, you know, problematic, et cetera. So I think depending on where you are and, you know, what the usage of the land has been historically will indicate how far past that phase one you'll need to go. And in conjunction with your environmental folks, your uh, geotechnical folks and your civil, they can really guide you along with that process. Now, this doesn't just apply to the land as well. We're, we're talking about development from the land up, but I know Bazudo in particular, and, and we have done adaptive reuse projects that we've either bought or have owned. And the same kind of studies that we're talking about for the land absolutely needs to be done for the existing assets as well, because there are risks in taking on buildings um, uh, with existing conditions. You got to obviously look into their use, look into their age, you know, proud of what, 19, what is it, 1988, you got lead, you got asbestos in these older buildings. You got all these different things that studying, whether it's land or existing buildings, studying the existing systems, you absolutely have to do study rigorously because things are still going to come up that you didn't catch. Like half of your pipes are rotted out and you were anticipating utilizing the existing plumbing in a building. We've run into stuff like that where you should scope them. Stuff that goes beyond uh, an environmental phase one or an add-on uh, that you need to study for what you plan on uh, building or constructing. Yeah, Tom, I would agree with that. And you know, we do a lot of renovation work. About half of the units that we turn from a construction perspective are renovations per year. We're dealing with a lot with a you know a lot of early 1900s, you know, mid 1900 type buildings and. Going in early and getting a hold of the building and doing your destructive testing, tearing apart units, going in, checking the piping, looking at all your electrical infrastructure, looking at all your asbestos, whether it's on the exterior or the interior, and doing all the things you talked about. If you miss any of those issues, the the domino effect that can happen after you miss those are catastrophic from either you know, being able to work and get people in and out of the building appropriately, having to tear open walls you weren't originally, you know, anticipating tearing open, having to do different types of PPE and means and methods to get the work done. So when you're doing a renovation type project, getting in early, very early in the project, and frankly, before, you know, the, the diligence period is over, uh, is what we try and tell our, our development partners, because, you know, once you're on the hook, you're on the hook, um, is, is critical uh, and, and, and very, very much so in the renovation world. I was just thinking on the same topic too, like things of uh, like when you hire a consultant, your architects, or your consultants don't cheapen up on paying them to do detailed surveys of existing conditions. I think that's a that's a, a mistake to make. It's worth spending the time with the design team and the construction team if you have somebody on board to help you identify existing conditions. And there, there's a lot of great technologies out there too, just to throw out a few with, with the ground, there's ground penetrating radar, there's infrared scanning that you can do of walls and other kinds of scanning of walls. And there's the, all this, the folks that have the point cloud, um, you know, survey equipment now that can identify locations of things. So there's a lot of great tools that can be leveraged along the way too. Um, so it's important to think about those and, you know, use your team to, to uh, figure out what makes sense. Jonathan, you, you just mentioned the point cloud survey. I didn't know what the term was, but we brought one of those guys to come into uh, an empty warehouse that we owned, where the steel and the, um, the, the joists are 40 feet, 50 feet in the air. And the amount of studying that you can do to figure out where, as you just put it, everything is, is vital for what you're going to do. 
And we've used those groups before that come up with a 3D electronic model that allows your design team to design to what is actually there. And it, it, right there, that just mitigates a ton of risk because working in redevelopment, reconstruction, oftentimes you find things are, that you weren't anticipating were there. There's a way to map out at least what you can see. You still have the risk of what you can't see, but um, um, it, it's we found that to be a very, a very cost efficient, valuable tool to our design team. Yeah, and, and we've utilized that on our renovation projects as well, doing, doing the LIDAR scanning coordination. And we also utilize it for a lot of our new construction pieces as well. You know, a lot of times, I think everybody's seen the picture where the HVAC duct hits the steel beam, right? Um, right. You know, we, uh, we've, we've uh, mitigated thousands of conflicts during doing virtual construction and, you know, trying to work those things out in a, uh, in a virtual design uh, type of um, scenario. So, you know, we do... Uh, we do take that very seriously and we found that to be very productive for us and our subcontractors and mitigating issues ahead of time, as opposed to somebody getting out in the field and saying, well, this doesn't work. Let's spend three, four weeks trying to redesign it before we actually get to install the work. So I think to the extent that you can get some of your more complicated projects in, in, engaged in that type of design coordination, I think it's very fruitful and um, something that we use a lot on a lot on many of our projects. Let's turn to the construction contract as a mechanism for allocating risk and, and dealing with costs. Jonathan, I know this is definitely a, a focus of yours and, and of real projectors. Can you talk a little bit about how you approach that issue? And then I'd love to hear from Thomas and Brian on, on the same question. Sure, I'd be glad to. So uh, we, we look at a contract as ideally, it's not just a checkbox that the, the team's going through with their with their attorneys like Saul Ewing, but they're um, taking the time to think through allocation of responsibilities and expectations. And that to me, when it comes to controlling costs, it's uh, two significant factors. Who's best able to control the cost or, or you know, control and manage the, the procurement process in general? And then who's best to bear the risks of if something doesn't go as expected? And those sometimes align with each other, they often don't. Um, so for instance, you know, who, if should a contractor um, be responsible for buying something and bear the entire risk or should there be a shared risk um, that's, that's um, put in place? And a lot of factors come into that, which is depending how far along the design is, what the relationship is between the parties. And, and at this point, I'm really thinking as between a contract between owner and general contractor, for instance, then there's obviously other contracts that uh, like Brian could talk about between owner and subcontractor and supplier and things like that. But as between owner and GC, it's really thinking about um, who's best to bear those things and who can control them. And, and that's, I, I see a lot of people misaligning those things, which is uh, an owner thinks that they can buy something cheaper, like light fixtures from their favorite friend, and then they pre-purchase them and want to hand them off to a contractor, and they find out it doesn't really save you that much money, and you just create a whole lot of headache for yourself. And if there's any institutional buyers out there, it can work in certain cases. I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong if you buy a lot of things and you have good relationships, but the folks that try to do a one-off to think they're going to save 10% and they end up spending a lot of time, they can't make decisions in time. They don't know where to store the stuff once they buy it. Um, somebody had the wrong expectations. It wasn't put right in the design. I can go on and on and on about some of these things that we've seen go awry with the best intentions at hand. And so... Um, that, that, and that gets that, that expectation and structure should get memorialized in a contract from my viewpoint um, and, and really have people think through those kind of stuff. Um, if, if there's a delay from the permit agency or whatever, who's best to bear that? Who, who can control it, for instance, if anybody and who should bear that kind of risks? Um, and then at a higher level, I think, because we have a variety of different, uh, what I'll simply call buyers on the, in the line, I think, which is like, can you bear that risk? Is it something if, if you are a nonprofit or some kind of organization that really has a fixed budget and can't bear a cost bust, then you're going to have to push that down to somebody else to manage that risk and bear it because you can't. Um, if you're a private equity folks like some of our clients are, they, they, have, they can bear the cost and they, they don't want to pay extra because it's kind of a, an insurance policy to push that risk on somebody else. Um, so they don't want to pay extra for somebody else to bear the risk. They're willing to share in that risk and, and, and trade in the rewards that come with um, 
with uh, maybe getting a lower price and, and but having the potential of having to absorb something that uh, wasn't as expected. And so I think it's always worth spending time on that. We we see folks naturally not want to spend time in this regard to think through the relationship. They just kind of jump into writing a contract and kind of move on their way. So that's that's my point of suggestion. Brian, I saw you grinning during part of the uh, uh, part of Jonathan's uh, answer. Do you want to share some of your thoughts on the topic? Well, I think uh, I'm going to bring Jonathan to my next owner meeting where they want to provide any sort of fixtures so that I can have him as my advocate. Or maybe I'll just share this recording. Um, you know, I, I I totally agree with what you know with, with what Jonathan um, put out there as it relates to owner supply materials and managing that risk. A lot of owners do see that they want to try and save that 10%, but then your electrician's going to charge you to handle it, unload it, store it, and they're probably going to charge you a little bit more on their labor um, just to try and make up those costs. So um, there's really not a whole lot of savings there, and then some of the some of the headaches that come along with that and potential delays that the owner's not used to managing. Are, um, are incredibly problematic. So, you know, I would concur with 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 his uh, sentiment on that. You know, for us in dealing with the contract, there's really two sections that we see it. It's the legal terms, which, um, you know, we let Jim go out and, and, and hammer away on in our behalf. And then there's the business terms. You know, what kind of fee do we have? What's the savings clause, those types of things. But more importantly, as it relates to managing the risk for, you know, an owner or a contractor, it's, you know, what is our qualifications and assumptions? You know, we always attach those to our construction contract. And all too often, even though we go over it with the owner and, and the design team, it ends up being a point of contention at some point in the project. And, you know, a lot of times when these deals are put together, everything's not completely, you know, figured out, right? Whether it's a specific specification for a piece of millwork or to Jonathan's point, who's carrying the lumber cost, for instance, you know, given that's been a hot topic recently. So going through the qualifications and assumptions and making sure that owners and and um, you know the design team really understand where we are making some sort of notation that deviates from the plan or you know is outlining something needs to be clarified is incredibly important. So I would always recommend that if there's a Q and A attached to a contract that you read that all the, you know all the way through the whole pre-construction phase to understand exactly what your contractor's setting forth. And then secondly, um, it's it's focusing on allowances and you know there's a few reasons for this. Um, you know, if there's, for instance, some contaminated soil on a project, we might put an allowance on it for X amount of dollars because it's unquantifiable right now and the owner decides they want to put a certain dollar figure to it. There's a lot of different things that we could put allowances to, but understanding where they are and putting a hyper focus on them in pre-construction and operations to make sure that you're sorting out that issue and something that's an allowance doesn't become a design decision or something that's going to be critical path um, down downstream. Um, especially given where we are in today's market where, you know, a vinyl window was, you know, it used to be a month or two months and now it's, you know, five, six, seven months, you know, making your decisions on your window colors um, or what type of window you're using can become much more critical now than it ever once was, especially if your contractor is not properly telling you the new lead times as of yesterday or today because they're ever changing. So for us, it's hyper focus on the qualifications and assumptions on the project, which is really the biggest miss on uh, risk mitigation that we see. And then going through your allowance items and making sure that you guys itemize those and get those attacked early um, and, and, and specifically in the project. Thomas, did you want to add something there? Yeah, there, was a lot to, <laughs> there was a lot of information that was just unpacked there. It, it's really kind of funny. Yeah, it, this is a great discussion item and I'm going to be the one outlier. Um, uh, these guys, both Brian and Jonathan mentioned, yeah, uh, some owners try to save money by going to a, a light vendor in, in working at, and I, and I totally agree with them. However, oftentimes, again, time, project management 101, time and money, those are the two primary considerations and time equals money. So when we're designing a project, if I'm designing it in the fall with an expectation of, um, going to bid and, and all that sometimes we come to a junction where the steel is not going to be there in time so we've got a lot of relationships with steel vendors that we'll go to sometimes and it's not it's not to save money maybe sometimes it does but we'll bid out the steel without a general contractor we'll select a steel fabricator not necessarily the erector but at least the steel fabricator to fabricate and deliver the steel to a project and you ask why would you do that because if we're bidding out a job that takes a month, you release a job, they start on site and concrete, 
and then you find out Steele's got a five-month lead time item and you should have ordered it three or four months prior, we'll get out ahead of that if we're going to commit to a project. So we'll do that. We also do that with mechanical equipment to an extent. And because we hold our assets for 20, 30 years and we replace rooftop units, chiller equipment, all that kind of stuff over our 20 million square foot portfolio, we've got deep relationships with a lot of these um, uh, suppliers of equipment, Habtech being one of them, who can get us rooftop units, chillers, all that kind of stuff, either on new construction or existing. So sometimes we go in a negotiation to make sure we can get the materials when the construction um, schedule requires them. Several years ago, I remember when the, when the construction market was really, really hot. You guys may remember, Jonathan, I'm sure you do. Um, precast used to have like an 18 month lead time, ridiculous. And your construction schedule might be 14 months altogether. So you got to buy or commit to a, a slot in fabrication far in advance of when you need it and probably far in advance of when you're, get, you're gonna select a general contractor. So sometimes we have to make those decisions, again, to mitigate the risk to lock in on a price of steel or, or for time reasons to make sure that happens so you can get a successful outcome of, of a project. On the flip side of that coin, we've been in a position where we thought we were gonna commit to something. We bought four or five stories of, uh, of a steel package and then come to the realization that um, for one reason or another, we didn't pull the trigger on the building. Now, we make those decisions sometimes, though rarely, and sometimes we have to store the steel in an industrial yard, and we'd only make that decision if we knew that that building wasn't going to change size-wise. Size so we'll make those decisions. Yes. Something to add on to what Brian said. Oh, oh I'll, I'll give a break. <laughs> no, you can keep going if you I'll want. Talk forever. <laughs> no, you, uh, yeah. you, you, you raise you raise Go a great ahead. point about allowances and contingencies, because for a lot of unknowns, uh, we'll throw an allowance at something, and for other things, there'll be contingency, and there'll also be buyout savings if you're doing uh, a, a guaranteed maximum price uh, style contract, cost plus with a GMP. And we, there can be a debate on who gets to control those contingencies, those allowance, the buyout savings, all those kind of things. It depends on the contract that you select, lump sum contract versus GMP. Um, I like the transparency. Sometimes even with the lump sum, we'll add allowances. And if they're not used, we get 100% of that back. But in a lump sum condition, if a dollar is saved generally, that goes to a contractor. But in a GMP, maybe we'll go to buyout savings maybe it would go to contingency. There's different ways to handle it. And I, I love, again, Brian, that you talked about a savings clause because we debate that here in-house till we're blue in the face. And there's different opinions about savings clause. Is that a good thing? Uh, if you have a GMP or not, is that money that is free money you're just giving away to a contractor, the savings clause? I might argue that it aligns interest with the contractor if managed properly, because you want to give the contractor a reason to go out and work hard to save money that's even lower in the budget uh, to, to the owner's benefit. And you want to give them an incentive to do so, which may come in the form of a savings clause. Yeah, Tom, and I, I, I agree with that. Going back to what you brought up earlier, which I think is a great part, a, a great point, especially with the current climate and material lead times about buying steel early for your deals. You know, for us, and this goes back to that hyper-focus on pre-con, when we build a budget, you know, at a schematic design or development design, you know, we can't just put dollars on a piece of paper without having a schedule, right? So we always build out a pretty detailed schedule related to whatever project we're going to be building. Um, and what we do to take it one step further is we'll put together a material tracking wall, which we have a standardized format for that ties to our schedules logic. And we'll back into when we need certain things on site from the NTP and then look at the current lead times that we're tracking internally and see what we need to release early. Now, certain jobs, if we're pushing dirt on a new construction project for six months, a lot of your materials aren't going to be that critical. 
However, if you get into an adaptive reuse scenario where two months after you start your project, you're turning units, you literally need every single part and piece down to the down to the mini blinds within your first eight weeks. So what does that do to sort of an early start concept where we would go to an owner and say, based on these lead times and how quickly you want us to turn units in order for us to be efficient and get you started in revenue generating uh, as close to NTP as possible, we need to release all of these different parts and pieces ahead of NTP. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to deliver your, your product on time, given the current market climate and, um, and, and lead times for delivery. So for us, we've started doing that historically on our renovation deals, always going back years. And now, given the current climate and some of the um, market impacts we've had from COVID and the squeeze on materials, we're doing that on every single project that we have. And what we'll find is certain products and projects that we've never even thought we would have to do an early release for that were just pushing dirt. All of a sudden we're asking our owners for steel release, rebar shop drawings, those types of things to get the project set up for success out of the gate. So we're not dealing with um, material lead time issues. So again, that goes back to having a hyper focus on pre-con. I can't emphasize that enough on how important that is to making sure that once we get our operational team on site that it can actually be successful. So we have a question in the chat, which I think touches on this. Uh, the question is, what is the panel's opinion of the construction manager at risk process? What are the benefits over other processes? And do you think it saves cost in the long run? And with a construction manager at risk, the, const the contractor is really brought in earlier in the process and there's a focus um, in, in, as uh, on pre-con. So, I'll just toss it out to um, each of you. Um, who wants to tackle it first, Brian or Jonathan? I'm happy to go. You know, for us, we believe we're a relationship-based company, so we feel as though if we're engaged from the start of a process, when it's really just a cocktail napkin sketch, we can help guide the process along the way to the most successful way that it can be. You know, if you take a look at you know a construction manager and their percentage of costs it's very minimal compared to the overall project, typically less than 10%. Our costs are fixed. We can negotiate a fee and GCGRs out of the gate. And then our costs are fixed, right? So a lot of the really good partners that we have, they'll do an RFP and they'll ask us for our fee and our general conditions and our schedule based off of a concept type project. And then they work with us all along the way in an open book format to where we're getting four or five bids per trade. We're leveling those bids. And then those are just costs of the work that we do in an open book format so they can see who we're selecting. Um, the benefits of that is, you know, who your contractor is all on the way. Your competition is, is, is worked out in the beginning because you, you lock in the fee. And we bring in some contractors to help guide the process all the way along to keep guardrails up on the design team to help, you know, mitigate the overall cost of the project. So for us, we feel as though that gets you to the best number. That's the most buildable project. That's the best planned all on the way. And that's how we work with our in-house deals and the majority of our third party deals. Although we do do um, a good deal of lump sum hard bid type projects, um, you know, that we're successful in as well. But from our perspective, our recommendation is to do that negotiated path. Let us compete on who's the better CM out of the gate and then let's work together throughout the entire process. Yeah, I kind of weigh in on this too. So I see it at a variety of different perspectives is that one kind of an overarching general comment is most general contractors practice as CM at risk these days. There, there's not like a, a lot of contractors don't do their own work in house. So they're like not as much as they used to 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, for sure. So they, it is a construction manager that's pulling together a variety of experts in various trades and suppliers to make things happen. So from my perspective, most work essentially is CM at risk. And then the second piece of it is what for like who's sharing the risks what are the risks and how are you you know what kind of contract and pricing arrangement are you using for it is kind of the, the secondary piece of that relationship are you are you putting all the responsibilities on that contractor in a lump sum format or are you you know doing more of a cost plus arrangement and if you do a cost plus arrangement then is there a cap to that known as a guaranteed maximum price so I kind of see them as like somewhat two separate things that probably other people see them as, but um, that, that's just my general thought. And there's pros and cons to all that stuff, but. Um. Great. We're starting to get, oh, Thomas, did you want a chance on that one or? Oh, I, and I, I think Jonathan really touched on it. Lump, uh, and I think you have to put a CM or a general contractor 
at some level of risk because if not, then it's an open budget and there's no reason to really cap construction costs. You need to put a cap on it to insulate yourself. So how do you do that? Again, lump sum contract, if your drawings and your documents are far along enough that you their drawings are really, really tight, it's easier, I think, for us to do than say a residential project because we're doing generally a core and shell with a finished lobby, but open spaces in the office. Uh, we don't build out until the tenant comes in. So they're, they're fairly simple and straightforward. So we'll do a lump sum contract that basically puts the, the CMGC at risk to whatever that number he provides. Other times when we got to uh, get started earlier, bring a contractor in to help us make decisions, we'll ultimately work towards a guaranteed maximum price on it. But both contracts, again, put that CM at risk and make sure there's a cap to it. Um, you just got to also watch uh, how contingencies are built into it. Because if you put the CM at too much risk, they're going to build up their contingencies and they're fat in the numbers because they're not going to get burned, right? They, they're in business to stay in business. And uh, they're going to offset that risk with contingencies that are in the divisions, uh, 16 divisions that you buy. Great. We have just uh, about three more minutes here. I want to give each of you a chance to uh, say if there's anything that you uh, wanted to emphasize in terms of cost, do so. And then we'll, uh, I'll say thank you and, and we'll be done. Uh, why don't we start with you, Jonathan, we'll go in reverse alphabetical order on this, if there's any any additional points on, on controlling or mitigating costs. Yeah, kind of two words of wisdom. These are words of warning maybe for things that I hear thrown around as magic solutions to our dynamic cost situation. One is futures pricing is not the same as real pricing, uh, whether it's lumber or steel or others. There's the, the futures have lots of complications of people trying to guess what the future might be. And there's a lot of incentive for people to make money off of those futures. So be careful with that. It's better to deal with real pricing on the ground that comes from Brian or somebody else. Um, caution number one. Two is modular and offsite construction. People are proposing that as panaceas to all of our issues. All of the modular and offsite construction folks are dealing with the same supply and labor issues as the folks that build on site. So while I'm a huge fan of offsite construction, it's not the solution that some people are pitching it to be. So make sure you you think about these things wisely. Great, uh, Brian. Yeah, for me, you know, and I think this will be a reoccurring theme from what I've said today is, you know, you cannot focus enough on your deal before the deal starts. It'll make the deal in operations much easier if you put a hyper level of focus and attention on the project before it starts, rather than trying to catch the catch the cat by the tail after the job starts. And then once the job does start, getting buyout done incredibly fast. You know, we attack buyout on our deals with a team approach. So we'll bring in a bunch of PMs that are on projects that are you know have capacity to buy jobs out. Um, we try to be 50% bought at NTP and 90% and bought within 90 days to try to mitigate the overall project issues. Um, and that goes alongside with allowances. The longer you leave allowances and unselected materials um, out in the open, the, the, the higher propensity you have for change, escalation, and delays. Great. Thomas? Well, I'll take a little bit different as a tact. Um, I, I saw in some of the attendees on here there is some youth in there. And if I were to talk to any of them, um, again, real estate is a very relationship-based business uh, with architects, with contractors, everybody, other land developers, absolutely everybody. And particularly in this case with contractors, we don't bid to contractors we don't know or know, at least know of. We also don't always take the low bids. We take the smartest bids and the most responsible bids and teams that we select. But developing relationships with everybody you come into contact with, I personally think is absolutely vital because there's got to be trust. If, if uh, Brian's bidding on a project, he doesn't trust me, I don't trust him, it, it's, we're going to get bad or faulty numbers that are going to increase your risk or and or increase your costs in time. So I, I think focusing a lot on the relationships is vital 
um, for a project and a career. I think that is a wonderful note on which to end uh, a, a really terrific discussion. Um, I'm very happy to have relationships with each of the three of you. And I think that's a fun foundation of um, business and life. Uh, there are some questions in the chat we didn't get to. We'll try to follow up uh, via email. In fact, I saw one of the comments was actually on technology, which we've talked about as a potential future webinar. Uh, uh, that concludes our discussion for today. You'll receive a follow-up email, uh, which will include the contact information for the panelists. We've also been recording this, so it'll be available on the Sol Ewing website and probably the websites of Real Projectives, COP, and Bazuda Construction. Feel, please feel free to reach out to any of us about questions that you might have about uh, construction projects. And thank you very, very much to our panelists and to our attendees. Thanks, and we'll be signing Thank you, out. Jim. Had a great time. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Jim.